Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second interview in Holon IQ's Digital Health Disruptor series. Uh, my name is Vernon Baxter. I'm the Vice President of Holon IQ's Health Intelligence Unit. I'm delighted to uh, be joined today by Sam Shah, who is arguably one of the most connected men in digital health, no pun intended. And, uh, and, and we'll talk about some of his various roles today. But firstly, Sam, thank you for being here. Hello, Vernon, and thank you for inviting me. It's great, great to join you today and great to join and Holland IQ and this discussion. Thanks, Sam. So we'll come back uh, to Sam uh, shortly, but just quickly, just to set the scene, the Holland IQ's health disrupt, uh, digital health disruptor series, this is the second of a, a five-part series where we're going to be talking to some of the most innovative and informed people across the digital health market. Um, the, la the, the opening episode of the Digital Health Disruptor series uh, featured Adam Dakin of Dream Adventures, and you can find that on our website. So uh, in terms of today, the idea is that I'm going to talk to Sam about some of his experience um, across his kind of many and storied career <laughs> working across as a doctor in the NHS, but also as one of the leading figures in digital health um, generally. Um, as Chief Medical Strategy Officer of Newman, Sam recently uh, <clears throat> is part of a team that um, uh, finished a 60 million Series B round earlier this year for a digital platform focused on sexual health. And so, so the point of today's discussion is to learn a bit from Sam about how Digital, digital health takes root across the system and some of the barriers and some of the difficulties that we all kind of face as we try and roll out some of this technology. Okay, so just quickly, as part of the um, discussion, I just want to introduce Holon IQ. So Holon IQ is a world leading impact intelligence platform, which uh, spans, as you can see from my slides, uh, across healthcare, education, and climate. So as you can see from our uh, client um, uh, slide here, we've got an amazing group of organizations that we work with from across government and NGOs, uh, technology, finance, universities, and multinationals, as well as amazing growth companies across education, healthcare, and climate. So Holon IQ is uh, an impact intelligence platform that helps people understand complex markets and how they're evolving and understanding some of the leading organizations that are emerging in these kind of fast changing and complex sectors. Uh, we're also uh, trusted as a data source by some of the world's leading um, media. And, you know, just for a bit of context, last year, Hulan IQ was um, cited more than 3000 times in the, in, in, by some of these amazing uh, media organizations that you see uh, on the slide in front of me. So just to, um, before we get started with the conversation, I just want to give you a, a bit of further context about Holon IQ Summits program. So as you'll see, not only do we create the impact intelligence platform, which is a, you know, a trusted source of information and market intelligence, we also get out there, we get around the world and in the Second half of the year, we were planning uh, to be in 14 different locations. Uh, and as you can see from the slide, we kick off with an event in New York on the 22nd of September before over a, a sort of a 10 week period traversing the world, uh, bringing together leaders from uh, across education, health and climate. So really exciting uh, program of events globally. And I'd love to talk to uh, people internationally about uh, our, the part in the uh, participating in the health program. But to um, get us started, I think I, I, I want to come back to Sam. And uh, before we um, before we started this, uh, I was uh, saying to Sam that it was quite fitting that I was speaking to him from, from the, uh, the, the bowels of a WeWork office in London, where Sam was telling me that uh, Newman Health, which is one of the businesses that Sam works with, uh, has roughly uh, increased in size by 10 times since... Uh, uh, since he joined. So Sam, maybe if I can uh, d d just start by uh, asking you how that's all going. Well, first of all, I mean, it's a really 
fun environment, I have to say. So if anyone who hasn't worked in one of these kind of environments, it's great with lots of other companies that are also growing and have a growth mindset. And it's good to you know have a team that is really enthusiastic and thinking about how we grow and change healthcare and how we serve people in a different way. So yeah, it's been it's been a fun 18 18 or so months and uh you know now we're at a point where we've had to we've had to move into a bigger space which has been really interesting and thinking about how we get to our next iteration of of growth whether that's uh, internationally and also across the different things we do for people so yeah i highly recommend it to anyone that hasn't tried it to definitely give it a go especially if you've been in government or the corporate sector for a while thanks sam so it'd be good to uh, take a step back uh, before we get into the specifics of Newman and uh, the money that you've raised recently and your growth and the, the team's growth uh, and then maybe some of your other kind of roles, previous and, and future. Uh, but I'd l- love just to start by getting your perspective on, I suppose, the essay question. And the essay question is around disruption in digital health. I wonder if you could kind of give me a sense. I mean, you've probably been working in this space. I, I'd, I would I would hate to hazard a guess, but I, I would say more than ten years, probably close to twenty by now, Sam. And where would you say we're where we are in terms of the degree of momentum, the level of pe- penetration, uh, attitudes towards digital health? Could you maybe start by giving us a flavour of how you see that? So a fascinating question, and probably one that I could talk about ad nauseum every single day. But the interesting thing is, I don't think we're in any one place. I think we're in multiple places, depending on the dimension of the question. And when I think about digital health, I think about it in in four verticals. I think about it around data and infrastructure, telehealth, telemedicine and access to sort of specialist type services, and then consumer facing digital health apps, wearables, and all four of those in a very different place. And sort of, if we took a step right back, I think data and infrastructure is probably very mature and continues to mature. We get more and more sophisticated products, services, applications around the use of data. We certainly saw that over the last two years during the the COVID period where we had the best of researchers, pharma, uh, data analysts, machine learning experts coming together to very rapidly produce drugs in a way that never could have been done before. So that's really promising. And then we've got telehealth, telemedicine, apps and wearables. And telehealth has been growing for the last few years in the UK and globally. We've seen more and more telehealth providers connecting citizens to clinicians, whether that's access to a GP or family physician, access to hospital. We're seeing more and more of these kind of the equivalent of whether it's Teams or Zoom or any of these things, the equivalent in healthcare has been happening now for especially the last two years, but before that too. They got telemedicine though suddenly there's been a realization that we can democratize a bit of this and put diagnostics in people's hands and connect them to specialists using tools whether it's remote monitoring devices or others so that's begun to sort of start up and grow mainly in the last six to twelve months but of course it existed before that and then there's apps and wearables rapidly growing at pace every single day there's a new app a new website a new something that emerges but this is the interesting thing I'd almost say as fast as it's growing, it's also becoming the wild west of digital health. And there's lots out there that it's difficult to know what's good, what's not, what works, what's safe. Uh, so as a sector, I think it's still new. The infrastructure bit is is older and, and has been more stable. But overall, whilst there's been some progress in the last two years, has mainly been out of necessity. So I think there's a long way to go, a lot of scope to make a change. And I think now, globally, with the need for healthcare continuing to increase, demand is sort of skyrocket high, I think we'll see some innovation and new models emerge, new needs, and a new way of putting things into people's hands for themselves to use, as opposed to it being completely clinically led. Yeah, I, I think as a, you know, in my background, I've kind of reported on the NHS in one way or the other for the past 15 years. And digital health has always been in some ways a bit of a burden in the sense that you know we talk about digital health it's not one thing as you've identified it's multiple channels it's different elements of the system and you know i think there are many people in the uk that are scarred from big it uh, projects such as the mp fit and uh, uh, other kind of initiatives like that 
I'm interested, obviously, and this maybe leads us into talking about Newman and your, your role there. It, I'm interested in this kind of split between B2B and B2C digital health propositions. Maybe um, for those who don't know, Sam, if you could kind of give us a bit of an outline about Newman in terms of where it came from, what it sets out to do, and we can sort of maybe talk, start talking about how that B2B and B2C um, interface will work going forward, especially in relation to digital health. Well, it's probably worth actually explaining just a little bit of context uh, before I suppose I even talk about Newman maybe. And if we think about most traditional healthcare systems around the world, they were traditionally a B2B model. They're often a supplier of some variety selling to another system, whether it's a hospital system, whether it's a tech system, whether it's an insurer, an HMO, a payer, that was classically the relationship. And no, not really that different in, in the UK either. So you have two kind of, two emerging trends. One, which was a very direct to consumer model, physically someone walking into a pharmacy or practice and self-paying. And on the other side of the world, mainly the Western world, a very sort of insurance, social insurance, state funded model that emerged. And classically, the selling of these two things were either or, there wasn't an in-between and the blend wasn't great, but it, but it existed. If I take something like the NHS by way of example, classically, any state funded system, whether it's the NHS, whether it's a system in, in Germany, in France, in any other part of the world, can only go so far. There's a degree of rationing. There'll always be more demand than there is need. And there'll always be less resource than there is uh, the ability to sort of uh, pay and provide. And that always then means there'll be a group of people that won't get treated or seen. And so any system has to make decisions, and that's no different in the UK to anywhere else. And we take a place like the UK, it's based and designed on a system of prioritization and need. And we see that very much right now. We can see it in the NHS where there are waiting lists for people to be seen, where there are certain things that are rationed that aren't provided for, uh, and that then creates a really interesting space. Now, of course, that system can't, of course, provide for everyone, but and also not everyone can necessarily choose an alternative. And that's where organizations and providers like Newman come along. So for Newman, it's been a number of things we've tried to solve. The first thing is, of course, trying to provide access for a group of people who've got willingness to pay to a healthcare uh, provision or service. And, and, that, and, and that started off in men's health. It started off with erectile dysfunction. That's where we, where we started on. That's what people probably know us for initially. And our whole approach there was, is who is it that's not getting access and is trying to get access and really approaching from a very different perspective. We think traditionally in that B2B space, there wasn't any need really to market the population directly. There wasn't really any need to use social marketing or behavior change. Whereas if for Newman, that's almost our entire existence. We are directly going to consumers, to people as patients, as citizens, and directly giving them messages that help them either access our service or recognize a need they may not have done before. Now, some people might say, well, doesn't the NHS already do that? Or don't, don't these states do that? Of course they do. And they do that from a public health messaging point of view. I guess the difference here is, is our approach. Our approach lends itself mainly from a very consumer-based approach. What is it that people relate to? And we deal with very taboo topic areas. We deal with erectile dysfunction. We deal with premature ejaculation. We deal with hair loss. We deal with things that people aren't typically used to talking about, the things that people find difficult talking about. And, and try to change that, try to try to move away from these things being totally taboo, difficult to access, hard to discuss, to making them accessible, creating a model where people can ask questions, where they're able to do it in a way through an online model from the convenience of where they are. Then we provide them a consultation, we decide if they can act, need to access treatment, we provide them with advice, and then they might contact us, they might then receive some treatment from us, and later on, they might have some blood tests and other things. And the whole aim is of, of, of ourselves is really about making that taboo topic area less taboo and also making it really accessible to get treatment. And think of it this way. All of those people that are suffering from those conditions probably, almost inevitably, have something else going on. But unless we start dealing with the problem that they're facing right now and deal with the practical need and the emotional need, the underlying range of clinical needs they will never necessarily deal with. And we recognize that 
people want to access mm. care, whether it's from a state provider like the NHS from their insurer, but not everything is available. So that's where we come in and provide that that space, which is which is in between in a very different sort of way. So that's kind of a bit about Newman. And, 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 and the whole approach is taking uh, really approaches that have been used in other sectors. We've seen it in the retail sector. Many of us have seen it in financial services. And which is how do we connect with people? And that is the important thing in a way that is meaningful to them, in a way that allows them to access health information, access changes in their behavior that they might want to uptake, and even make diagnostics easier to access in a way that others can't. So that's that's very much what we're about. And just on that point, Sam, about, um, I suppose, marketing and demand in healthcare, do you find it requires a bit of a mindset change from, let's say, the people that you used to kind of train with, you worked with within the NHS. I mean, you know, the NHS is free at the uh, the point of access, but it's also, as we all know, to a degree rationed by its capability to respond to demand. And have you had much pushback from uh, people within the medical system in terms of the concept of, I suppose, promoting access to medicine in that kind of way? or is a bit more nuanced. I think it's an incredibly complex area. And for any of us that have trained, you know, a system like the NHS is incredible. It's absolutely amazing. It's one of the most efficient systems in the world when it comes to healthcare. It's probably got one of the lowest administrative costs as a system compared to others in terms of what proportion of the budget is used for administration versus treatment. But it's very treatment orientated, very treatment focused and is designed around a system of rationing. If we take the guidelines in the UK, they're designed by NICE. NICE is designed around making sure that the most cost-effective treatment is available for the state budget. But that then means the state can't fund everything, and perhaps nor should it. But that also then means the clinicians that train in that system, myself included, are trained in the system to think and act in a certain way. That's absolutely right when we're in that system and, and credit to my colleagues that work in the system and the many other people that are there. But at the same time, when uh, we're, we're in that sort of system and we're doing that, that means the patients we see, we're only limiting what they have access to. We're not necessarily giving them the full range of choices and nor can we. And many clinicians I talk to, former colleagues of mine, current colleagues of mine, many others, I can totally understand the frustration they face with that system and the choices they have to make. But that then limits what the population has. And so where we try to change this is offer something that gives that middle ground where people can access diagnostics when they need to, can get access to advice at any time that they that they wish to, and have a service that is not restricted by hours, but it's available round the clock to anyone that can get online pretty much. So that's kind of the key difference, but that does require a big mindset shift and it also requires a mindset shift, mindset shift amongst those people who are marketing these services because you can imagine for a classic health service you don't normally have to promote it <clears throat> the lights are on the blue badge is out there people are going to head towards it in the nhs in a private service like ours actually you're not only just promoting it but you're also promoting it to the right group of people who can benefit and that's also important because like any provider we only provide treatment that's beneficial to the individuals. And in doing that, we have to also make sure that we're making the best use of our resource as well as getting to the right people. So that's an interesting shift as well. And that definitely requires a mindset shift. It also requires a different approach to health promotion and social marketing. Yeah, th thanks, Sam. In terms of, um, you know, you mentioned sexual health, which is obviously... I would say it's a, a subject matter that lends itself very well to that kind of medium because, you know, people for better or worse have difficulties kind of discussing it and present it in front of clinicians, etc. Could you maybe talk a bit about what Newman's strategy is now? I mean, I you know, looking into the business and seeing uh, the, the, the funds that you raised recently, it seems that that kind of diagnostic testing and personalised blood tests, that seems to be an area that you're, you're focusing in on now. Um, could you maybe give us an insight into, you know, how, how are you spending that money that you, you guys have raised? You, you know, like I, like I said at the start, you're now kind of close to 200 people. Um, what, what, what's next and, and how do you kind of keep that spirit of disruption? Well, if we think about the underlying causes around the conditions we've already dealt with, they all stem from metabolic parts of the metabolic syndrome. 
changes in hormones and changes in the way in which us as human beings respond to either our own hormones or lack of them. And that change in hormone balance is something that sort of underpins, sits underneath everything that, that goes on in terms of our bodies and how we respond. And of course, that is very true for, for men in particular. So one of the areas that we're now really going for and aiming for is how we deal with the range of metabolic syndromes and what else we can do to help people that will avoid some of the other conditions like erectile dysfunction, but what's sitting beneath that and below that. So areas that we're exploring, for example, are things such as uh, weight loss. We're thinking about testosterone deficiency. We're thinking about what else we can do around whether it's sleep or other sorts of lifestyle type conditions. So as we move on, it's more towards sort of lifestyle medicine. And, and that means we're going to change the range of things we offer. And a good example of that is the work that we've been exploring around, uh, around weight loss, which is, of course, something that is very common amongst those people that might be suffering from the conditions that we already deal with. And we can see that from people's blood results. We can see that from the lipid profiles. It gives us a good indication of what the needs are. And of course, we've seen that in the UK with the strategy around uh, obesity, for example. So we know there's a need there. And that's an area that we're certainly heading towards, moving towards very quickly. On the other side, diagnostics. This is really exciting. Once upon a time, we think about the use of uh, screening tools such as uh, home self-administered self blood tests, finger prick blood tests. It's quite difficult. They weren't as reliable as they are now. Often the, uh, the profile that was used was too broad. And what we've seen is the maturity in that model itself. We've seen maturity in the laboratory providers. We've seen acceptability change in society. People are much more willing to do these things themselves. So that means the way in which we can tailor a test also changes. And how we can use that test also changes. So, for example, if we were going to start a process of dealing with testosterone deficiency, the start of that would be a capillary blood test. Of course, that's not the only thing. We'd have to think about how we add to that. But that's certainly a starting point. And, and, and beyond that, that's, you know, the sky's the limit. And I certainly, from the innovation that I've seen around the world, diagnostics getting better and better. It's easier now to create diagnostics that are more accessible to individuals. They can self-administer. I mean, I was really impressed a few weeks ago when I was out in, in Israel looking at the technology that's being produced there around diagnostics. And you can really see where the future of this sector is, not only for us as Newman, but for everyone in this sector, because as they become more compact, easier to administer, link it to technology, use that technology to transmit and emit results, and use remote clinicians to provide a diagn diagnosis against that diagnostic, it makes it much easier for people to access healthcare and get to the right part of the system. So for us, as we're growing and we continue to grow, I certainly will see us moving into the metabolic syndrome and alongside that, treating a wider range of conditions, everything from weight loss, testosterone, sleep, everything else that goes alongside that. And then with that, oh, the range of types of blood tests and diagnostic will inevitably increase too. Sam, it's, di it's difficult to hear the phrase um, fing finger prick blood test without raising the kind of spectre of Theranos and obviously the huge fallout of uh, the, the kind of disaster that was from a clinical and investment perspective. I mean, maybe, maybe it'd be interesting to get your take on uh, to the extent to which that still maybe stymies innovation in that part of diagno uh, diagnostics, but also maybe use it as an opportunity to talk a little bit about your past life within the NHS, because we want to look forward and we want to look to the future, but a lot of the potential for digital health is for innovation to proliferate across large systems. And in your uh, position, which I believe was the, the first, you were the first of its name, uh, the as director of digital development at the NHS, it'd be good to kind of, yeah, to get your response to those two points. Firstly, the extent to which kind of incidents where this has gone wrong and quite kind of spectacularly wrong, how, the extent to you, you, you kind of encounter that when you talk to people. And then secondly, if you could kind of think about that point about how when you were within the NHS trying to affect change across complex organisations, maybe share some insights to how that rapid um, uptake of innovation can be achieved or where it falls, falls to the wayside. Completely. I, and, you know, the discussion around Theranos is probably something that comes up fairly frequently across the sector and not just for organisations like ours, but anyone, because there's so much to it. Everything from the role of investors, the role of regulators, 
the quality assurance processes, the due diligence, the people who work in those organizations. And, and, it, and I think it's a really important story and one that everyone should familiarize themselves with. And not just because of what went wrong, but we all learn from what happened as a, and, and, and change the future. And also we think about our own responsibilities, whether it's as investors, whether it's as regulators, whether it's as consumers, whether it's uh, potential partners, it's really important to understand it. And for me, the most fascinating thing was not actually just knowing about the story, but meeting the people behind the story. When I first met Tyler and, and he and I sat down and talked about what happened there, it was really interesting to sort of hear you know, the inside of what happened there. And, and, and principally, they were, as an organization, caught up in a range of things, both an exaggeration of their capability, a set of promises that they couldn't fulfill, more likely than not, pressure from their investors, uh, and in, in all reality, probably a lot of optimism bias around wanting to make something work that couldn't necessarily work. And the concept was not a bad concept, but their technology wasn't necessarily mature enough to do all the things that they wanted to do. And unfortunately, that caused a lot of damage across the sector. It reduced confidence across the sector. Uh, and at the same time, it probably sent shockwaves through the med tech and health tech communities uh, for quite some time, ripple that's still being felt as at today. The good thing, of course, and if we see some positive in it, is it did raise the game of everyone in the sector, in the providers wanting to ensure that they had better compliance regimes, investors doing more due diligence on organizations and having on board experts as part of that process companies themselves bringing on board the right people with the right skills to develop these products and services and also a sense of realism is what can be achieved and what can't be achieved it also spurred a whole range of new innovations in the sector and i say innovation because there are truly creative and novel technologies that emerged in response to trying to solve the problem they were trying to solve and certainly some of the tech that i've seen in other parts of the world starts off by trying to do what they're trying to do now the important thing and this is where the uk and the us now and even europe is probably further ahead than other places in that we do have especially in the uk one of the most regulated environments uh, in the world and that means the regulation around medical devices around healthcare technology around safety around laboratories is at a level that we probably won't find in most other parts of the world. Now, I say that's both a blessing and a curse, because on the one side, it's perfect for the population, that it means that the population is protected, the industry is protected, uh, and that we can always aim for getting better outcomes for people. On the other side, it can, at times, slow down innovation, it can slow down adoption. But I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. And I think it's good that there are checks and balances in place because it means that we all aspire to the same standards. If I go back in time, back to when I was in the NHS, and I've been in the NHS a long time, and when I was, certainly when I was National Director of Digital Development, it was a really interesting time. There's part of the role, so one half of the role was around running some major programs in urgent emergency care. The other part was about developing the ecosystem and working with everyone from accelerators, incubators, investor communities, SMEs, and many, many others who were uh, trying to change the system. For the joys being we were to occasionally go on to mute as there's a, there's a rumble that goes past. But um, try, trying to change the ecosystem of digital health in the UK, and that was by trying to connect people across the system to help bring in new technology and support either ideation more importantly, the adoption uptake of that. And that involved everything from participating in events, bringing communities into the NHS and trying to solve some of those problems. But the thing is, there were a lot of problems. The regulators at that time were certainly not aligned. And even some of that we see today. We see that today where some of the regulators step on each other's toes uh, around who is regulating what, or rather who is not regulating what. And that happens uh, from, from time to time. We still see that. There's also the whole commissioning model in a place like the NHS, the way in which the money is spent. You know, and imagine it is a fairly big health system, a 
about 160 billion in total is spent, including if we, if we add in all sorts of add-ons that go in during a year, and that's a lot of money, of which a very small amount is spent on healthcare technology, and most of which goes into data infrastructure. So the problem, of course, is that there is new technology. How does anyone actually get the resource out to spend on it? And that creates creativity. We've seen that with pro vendors. We've seen vendors that are both the service and the product. And that's fascinating to see people pivot and do that to make it happen. And that's a good thing. But we also have the, the, the concept of the way in which people work, the culture. And the culture hasn't changed. It doesn't change rapidly enough. Digital skills and literacy is still a problem for something as big as the NHS. And Matt, bear in mind, there's between 1.3 and 1.5 million workers. So a lot of people to get skilled up around digital health. There's the provider environment. It's not one thing. So for many people around the world thinking about oh, this NHS, well, actually this NHS is more than 30,000 individual provider organizations, each doing their own thing every single day. And when people think about herding cats, it's more than herding cats. It's, 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 it's an entire armada that you're having to try and move and change. So it's a really complex environment. And whether it's, whether it's me or my successors and others, it's not an easy environment when we think about innovation. Because on the one side, you've got a small SME that's trying to survive and do things rapidly and get a deal in the system. On the other side, you've got this thing that's planned for a year, two years in advance, where there's no free resource, where the skill set might not be there, where the integration and interoperability environment is very poor, and the regulatory environment hasn't yet caught up. When you add those things together, on the one side, you've got the pace and slowness of government and governance. And on the other side, you've got the speed and agility of startups, SMEs, and, and, and uh, that sort of incubator type environment. And putting the two things together don't always gel. Certainly in recent years, I think during the pandemic, we certainly saw that change, but that was out of necessity. That was the circumstance of the pandemic pushed that. But I don't think that's sustainable. And I think that happened for certain use cases. And I'll give you the example. You know, at a very basic level, we had almost a downgrading of the compliance around data governance, security and privacy. Well, that's okay during a pandemic where the necessity means we can accept that. In normal circumstances, we most certainly can't both in the UK and globally. So I think whilst you know, the NHS reasonably made some changes at a point in time, those changes aren't sustainable. And certainly going forward, I don't think that would be the case. And so we can see the tension between pace of change, digital innovation, and on the other side, the NHS. Now, whether people take comfort from this or not, it's no different anywhere else in the world. Certainly when I visited the Middle East, uh, Israel, parts of uh, the UAE, other parts of the world, they all face the same problem. The same happens in Canada, the same happens in Germany, the same happens in Australia. We're all facing a spectrum of the same thing to different extents. In Australia, they have the problems of morality to deal with mm. uh, and signals. In places like uh, the, the Middle East, we have the fact there isn't any legacy, but we've got a very different cultural environment. We've got this a similar situation where we've got legacy technology and legacy infrastructure and legacy ways of working in parts of Europe. We have the, the, the compound of a social insurance-based system in, in certainly in Western Europe. So there's different problems, different parts of the world, and we're all dealing with spectrum of the same problem. So the NHS is not unique, but the NHS has got no shortage of incubators and accelerators. You can't turn a corner without finding another one. Yeah, and I'm interested to talk about that financial ecosystem as well, because we've talked about the kind of regulatory and the kind of clinical and the practical side of things. But I, I think if we look at 2021 as a as a year, I think by nearly every metric, it's the, the, the year where the kind of the most funding has flowed into digital health. And obviously Newman was recipient of some of that investment, but generally the numbers were off the chart in 2021. 2022, it seems so far to be quite a different story. I mean, obviously there are wider factors going on in the financial markets and you know, um, instability. And so it's not one thing again, but just in terms of, I suppose it's COVID and it's maybe a sign of the discussion that we've got 33 minutes through and we have barely mentioned COVID, you know, in the UK in particular, it feels like we're coming out the other side or learning to live with it, if, however you want to characterize it. But in terms of, if you look at 2022 versus 2021, and we think about the momentum, do you feel any sort of sense that it's been lost or the appetite for um, investing into digital health has 
atrophied or if you look at you know some of the performance of the listed telehealth stocks for instance in the US it's been pretty punitive obviously shares are kind of nose nose diving globally across many technology sectors but yeah I, I'm just interested you know as a I, I, as a firm that's kind of riding that that wave to an extent how do you feel about that kind of financial element of this whole equation? Well, whether it's Newman or any of the other organizations that I'm involved in, I'm certainly not seeing any any waning of interest. And mm. if anything, I'm seeing more focused interest. And what we're now seeing is a little bit of consolidation in the market. We're seeing those areas that may have been fairly less mature, perhaps uh, are falling away. And those that may be more mature, we're probably seeing greater interest, greater focus, uh, and a recognition of the sorts of uh, types of organization, the maturity they need, and the sort of uh, s services they need to offer in order to continue and survive. And, and whether it's Newman or any of the others, I tend to find that doesn't really change. And I'm seeing that in mm. other markets around the world as well. And I think what we're seeing now is a greater degree of diligence and focus from investors as well around really identifying which are the organizations that are solving a need and will continue to solving a need beyond the circumstances of the first pandemic. And of course, we're now seeing the emergence of something new, monkeypox on the horizon. So I don't think the public health problem is gone. And, and certainly whether we think, well, however we think of COVID, we're just another phase of COVID and another phase of another set of infectious diseases. And so if we recognize infectious diseases haven't gone in the round, COVID or any of the others, and we've got non-communicable diseases that continue to cause a problem. So the problems in the health system in the UK and globally remain. That also means solving those problems remains. And we know that global governance around the world, almost because of the economic crisis, not just in the UK, but everywhere, can't necessarily put the investment in that they need. So that then makes a ripe environment for innovation because there'll be new providers that emerge and new people solving that problem in a different way for society, knowing those problems aren't going away. So I actually think that whilst we've got the economic problems that we have, and whilst there might be some change in the degree of investment that takes place, those that are investing are taking a more focused and diligent approach. And certainly, I think for any organization out there, if they're solving a problem that is a genuine problem, they've done their market analysis, they've really thought about how they can bring about behavior change in a way that others haven't, and they are going to be able to support people through a model that is going to bring them in that will help them and make a difference for a long period of time, I think they're more likely to, to succeed and survive in this environment. And it does require a different set of skills. It's not a traditional sort of healthcare provider set of skills, but these come from everything from marketing. This comes from how in which we look after people, not only as patients, but as customers, because people want that value. And I think if you can provide that value, things are certainly different. So I, I can certainly see that 2022 is very different to 21 in terms of where the focus is. But I think f across the sector, that focus remains on healthcare and health tech. It's just looking at things in a, in a much more diligent way than we perhaps needed to during the necessity of COVID when everyone was trying to help. Yeah. And Sam, we're getting towards the end of our uh, allotted time. And, you know, we've spoken a, a lot about the kind of various different hats you wear and we've touched upon your kind of experience as a clinician uh, as part of government and also in the kind of commercial realm but it'd be interesting to finish by hearing a bit about what you've been doing in I suppose the world of education and how a, a, a new generation of uh, health administrators clinicians and everyone involved in the system can kind of learn from some of these experiences could you maybe kind of give us a sense of some of the activities that you're involved in and maybe kind of give you an idea of what type of impact you're looking to achieve and those education institutions are looking to achieve. Well, I was really lucky enough to learn from lots of amazing people from lots of different organizations over the last 20 years. Uh, and I think it's probably incumbent on me and everyone else in the sector to do the same. And that's where we've got three initiatives I'm involved in. One is Ulster University and our uh, MSc program in uh, various MSc programs where we teach short courses, part of all those programs, uh, digital health, public health leadership. We've got UCLan, but we've got an MSc in digital health. And the most exciting probably is the work that we're doing with UCL Global Business School for Health. The first Global Business School for Health, we have a dedicated MBA program purely focused on health 
we have a digital health innovation in entrepreneurship, MSC, which again is, is hugely exciting. And what we're really aiming to do with that is teaching a new set of people, whether it's from governments and organizations around how to assess and evaluate healthcare technology, whether it happens to be people thinking about starting up something, but how to go about it. And that covers pretty much everything, from evaluation, safety, thinking about digital penetration in society, uh, looking for finance, how to invest. We pretty much cover the full spectrum of digital health and innovation. And, you know, I highly recommend people to have a look, join some of the webinars, they're free. Uh, and it's just a really interesting time to try and raise the maturity, not just in the UK, but globally around digital health innovation. Because if we do that, hopefully we're going to have a better outcome for society, better economic development for most nations around the world. And we should almost see digital health and innovation in that as a way of not only improving health and well-being, but creating economic benefit that will, of course, benefit society. Yeah, thanks, Simon. And just well, one final observation for me in, in terms of Holon IQ and the Healthcare Intelligence Unit. I mean, I, I just want to go back to something you said at the start about digital health and how it you know, digital health isn't one thing, it's many things. And it's both how digital is applied through the system, but also how digital is applied through innovation. And, you know, as part of our work, we look at the money that's been raised and the organizations that are uh, gaining support and getting traction globally. And, you know, I think if you take away the the, the sort of ups and downs of the stock market or f uh, venture capital, it's an incredibly exciting time and the, the types of businesses and the level of complexity and te technology that's been applied to health gives you a kind of lot of um, a lot of hope for the future but it's been super interesting Sam to have you with us today and to hear about someone who's doing it on the front line and uh, great to to hear that everything's going very well with Newman so uh, I will close things up now and uh, and thank you so much for contributing to our digital health disruptor series Sam and uh, best of luck with all your endeavors. Vernon, thank you very much for having me. Thank you to the team at Holland IQ for organising it. Always a pleasure to speak to you and uh, always happy from anyone listening to take questions, get in touch. Uh, very happy to help. Thanks, Sam. And thanks, everyone.